Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our government contracting proposals, a panel discussion. And we are pleased to have three panelists here today. Uh, so we will begin. And I want to welcome, we have over 156 attend, um, online at the moment, and we will be hopefully growing. We had over 30, 333 registered for this. So we thank you all for your participation. Uh, today's event is sponsored by Orange County Government. Uh, we need to mute someone. Please everyone stay muted. Uh, this, is, this is a panel. For the best viewing experience, please turn off video participants by clicking the carrot next to the start video, the video settings, go to meeting section, uh, click hide non-video participants. Please remember to keep your video turned off. The only three videos that we should be seeing are the three speakers. Uh, just a little, uh, if you have any questions, please write the questions in the chat box. We will get to them as um, at the end of the uh, three speakers. We'll do a short 10 to 15 minute presentation on each of their subjects and their expertise. And uh, please note that for recording purposes, no attendees' names or their company's names will be read or spoken. Um, so here I'd like to introduce our panel. I am Kara Vernon with PTAC. I am your monitor for, uh, moderator for today. We um, are very privileged to have three Space Coast speakers um, uh, talking on proposals. They are, all of them have over 30 years of experience in uh, pre preparing proposals and working in government contracting. Uh, from Juliet has grants experience and others have um, Whoever's writing on the screen, please stop. Um, who, uh, we have a customer's perspective, Gary Bodovich, who um, has experience in Na from NASA and Air Force for his, his career of 34 years. Uh, Juliet, writing to win is her, uh, is her topic. And she is a proposal writer with over 30 years of experience and a lot of grant experience. So for anyone out there that's doing grants, uh, we have an expert in our presence on grants. Um, Ed Kinberg is an attorney uh, with a, his experience uh, started in the army and he was a JAG officer. And uh, he is also a construction attorney and a government contracting attorney and they are all located in Brevard County. Kara, before we begin with Gary, um, I know Ed wanted to launch a couple polls here, so I have those ready if we want to go ahead and do those just to gauge the audience here um, and kind of see uh, where we're all at here in our journey. So we're going to launch the first poll here. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, we got some great numbers. Wow. 10 plus years, eight to 10 years. So we got a really good breadth of uh, companies here. That's awesome. I'm not seeing the results. You I'm will to share them here so oh. everyone can see. Okay. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Oh, very good. And then we have um, another question we're going to launch here. We have a total of three. What the heck is Sam? <laughs> That's funny. Who is Sam? Sam, I am. <laughs> no, I'm Sam. Unpleasant uncle of all of ours. <laughs> Very experienced good, good. group here. 
Yes. Well, could you show those, please? So the vast majority of people, very experienced here. And then last one here, and then we'll uh, go ahead and get started with the panel. Oh, wow. Go ahead and share those results. So a lot of people have uh, great experience. A lot of companies here. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. And um, I'd like to do that to get everyone engaged, engage the audience, but um, those are the three polls. So, Kara, back to you. Uh, the polling thing is still up. Oh, I just closed it. Let me know. Let us know if in the chat box if you need any screen view changes or anything. Okay, so we're ready to begin. We're going to start with the. If I can get my screen to change, the customer perspective, and Gary Bodovich. Um, he has uh, been with both the Air Force and NASA. And Gary, we really thank you very much for taking your time to uh, and sharing your morning and your cup of coffee with us this morning. And um, please explain how NASA evaluates proposals. <laughs> well, thank you, Kara. Thanks, uh, Steve and Eric, as well, for setting this up. This is really really powerful. Thanks for the invite to come and, and be a part of this. So, right, um, my portion is on uh, the perspective of a government proposal evaluator, the person who has to go through the proposals and do the scoring or evaluation. And uh, I guess my overarching recommendation to offers is, uh, you know, never forget that your proposal is going to be read by a human being, right? Uh, we often think of the government as this huge, nebulous, faceless bureaucracy, and I get that, and, and a lot of that is true, but eventually, at the heart of it, is a human being, and a person is going to have to read and decipher and understand as well as evaluate and score the work that you put on paper. And I would think that if that person's job is to evaluate what you submit, then in a way the offerer's job is to make their life easier and to make the proposal easy to understand and all those, you know, good grammar, good English rules apply. Make sure it's coherent and easy to follow. Uh, don't bury the important facts. That helps the evaluator. Overall, the evaluator has to be convinced. That's a powerful word here. They have to be convinced that you, the author, understand what the task is, you understand what's involved, you understand the work, you understand the risks. So write to convince the reader of all of those aspects. Uh, yes, there's, there's going to be some fluff in every proposal, but certainly look to put in the facts. That's what the evaluator is looking for. They have to base their decisions, their recommendations, on facts. So as you're writing, I would say, continuously ask yourself, why am I writing this? Is it relevant to the message that you're trying to convey? And I use a simple 
a simple approach of flow and traceability. Is what you're writing traceable to a requirement that was in the RFP? They asked for this and therefore I am including this in response or does it flow to a benefit to the customer? I'm including this because they're gonna get a benefit out of it. And if you can't trace it to a requirement or show how it benefits the customer, then ask yourself, so what, who cares, and why am I including this? Because that is what the evaluator will be asking themselves as well. So why, oh, Karen. Carrie, you can go ahead and swap. I'm, I'm trying. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, there we go. Thank you. So why is, you know, what you write in the wording and all of that important? Um, certainly, we like to always award to the lowest bidder. It's cost effective. And this slide is just a representation of kind of a spectrum of how cost is important, but then other factors become equally or in fact more important than cost. And what I'm trying to convey here is if we had a task or a job where uh, it was very straightforward, very little risk involved, there's a lot of potential offerers out there who have done this work before, it not complex or sophisticated, then certainly there's no reason not to award to the lowest offer. And we do that under a sealed bid approach. But as you move to the right on this slide, cost becomes one of other factors that are considered. Maybe there's some risk associated with not being able to get the job done in time. And therefore the government has to include in the contract award decision some other criteria or some other considerations. And then as you move to the right, then you could have many, many factors and sub-factors and considerations that the government finds even more important than cost. And we get into this realm of what we call best value. Best value is simply being able to award to someone who is not the low bidder. And our next slide, there we go, thank you. Uh, there's generally two aspects to a best value approach. Uh, this one discusses a sort of a two-step approach, which you'll find the term lowest price, technically acceptable or LPTA. And this is a little bit of a hybrid where, yes, there's a lot of bidders who can, who can do the work, but there is some aspect to the job some aspect to the task that introduces some risk and just simply going to the lowest bidder out there uh, brings, brings that risk to light. So the government establishes some screening criteria. My, my cartoon there is supposed to be a screen there of some criteria where all the bidders submit and then the government applies some criteria to establish who are qualified bidders, who satisfy our criteria. And then out of that pool of qualified bidders, simply going with the lowest bidder among them. The important thing to remember about LPTAs is that the criteria is not scored or ranked or anything like that. The criteria is very discreet. It's pass, fail, and you must pass every single one in order to get on the other side of that screen. And so it's absolutely imperative that you satisfy every single criteria and even more important to convince the reader that you satisfy every requirement. So again, don't bury that anywhere. Make sure it's plain as day to the evaluator, whether it be a checklist or you asked for this, here's the criteria. Yes, I absolutely 
satisfy that criteria, then here's my proof. Simple, leave nothing to chance there. Elsewhere in best value, we get to this trade-off approach and it scares some people off. It's the most complex, complex approach to, um, to contract awarding. But again, all it really means is that the government can award to people who are not the lowest bidder, that there are other factors and subfactors and considerations out there that could be significantly more important than cost. And in order to go through this acquisition process, the government needs to do an extremely thorough evaluation of the proposal. So if this is the type of, of award that you're participating in, be prepared for the government to really tear apart and look at every paragraph, every sentence, even word choice can be important. Hey Gary, yeah. somebody asked, is this similar to go, no go? Julian? Because I'm curious how also. Jul Juliet, please save all questions even from you and Ed. Oh, and okay, sure. Till we get to the panel discussion. Thank sure. you. Okay. So go ahead and Gary, it's a. Yeah, there we go. All right, uh, the good news is that uh, the government is required to describe how they're going to make their contract award decision. What are they going to base that decision on? And that's included in the RFP section M is the evaluation criteria that the government will use. And here they list their factors and sub factors. And of course, cost is always a consideration. It may not be the most important factor, but it's always a consideration. But there could be a request for what's your technical solution or what's your management plan or who are your key personnel and what is their skill set or do you have a quality plan? There could be multiple other factors out there and they'll all be listed. The government is also required to talk about what we call relative importance. All relative importance means is that out of all that multiple factors and sub factors, they're not all looked upon equally. Some are more important than others and they are required to tell you what are the most important factors? How do they compare to each other? They're not required to divulge their exact maybe weights or, or things like that or their exact methodology, but they are required to tell you, for example, the technical solution is more important than your quality plan or the safety plan is more important than cost or words like that. And that can be used to help you write and establish how do you want to um, assign that valuable real estate in the proposal pages. Certainly you want to spend the most time and effort in pages talking about those factors the government looks upon as the most important to them. When we get to the evaluation phase, well, those same evaluation factors and criteria that are described in section M that's what is used for the evaluation. The evaluator is given that same section out of the RFP. They don't come up with new criteria at this stage. And again, they're always asking, does the offerer, has the offerer convinced me that they truly understand the work, that they understand what it is that they're undertaking there? You have to convince the reader. And the best way of doing that is well, number one, don't simply reiterate the requirement right back to them. They know what the requirement is. They need a house. You can't say, okay, I'll build you a house. They want the details. They need the details. Convince them that you have done this before. You understand the work. You know what risks are involved. And if you understand what can possibly go wrong, here's the plan for what if that comes to pass? How do you mitigate those risks? And making claims is not 
going to work either. Everything has to be substantiated and backed up with facts. Remember, they may have a stack of proposals to read and everyone's going to make similar claims as to why they're the best. So you have to make sure that you have backed everything up with facts. And finally, don't leave them with more questions in their mind. What if this happens? What if that happens? Try to be thorough, complete, and address all their concerns and not leave them with more questions. Just so a little bit about the evaluation itself. Um, sometimes people are a little skeptical how that's done. Uh, it's important to remember every proposal is evaluated separately, all by itself, only looking at the evaluation criteria. That human being who's been assigned to do that evaluation, perhaps as part of a team, they're going to go through and look at the criteria. They'll address strengths, cite any weaknesses. There's probably some sort of a risk assessment. They may give a score or maybe just a color-coded assessment. Is it green? Is it yellow? Is it red? But the proposals are not scored compared to each other. In fact, everything is locked up and only one at a time do they get released. And it's not evaluated as a team. It's evaluated by individuals. And then when everyone is done, then they get together to reach consensus. Consensus is a difficult process as well. And it's not as simple as, well, you gave them a five and you gave them a seven, so let's just give them a six and be done. Two people looking at exactly the same words, the exact same criteria, one said five, one said seven. Why? That's the purpose of consensus. They have to explain, perhaps defend their position, and share that information that they have gleaned from reading your proposal and eventually come to consensus where everyone can agree on what that score should be. And then finally, again, the evaluator really is looking for details. Imagine that the evaluator is trying to build a case for selecting you above all your competitors. They need a strong position and they need facts. Again, not simply reiterating the requirement, but substantiating claims and supporting information. Ask yourself when you make a statement, well, who, why, where, when, you know, what is the process? What are the risks? Convince the reader that you really have a firm understanding of what's going on and a good solid approach. So the question of course is always, well, how much detail do they need? And unfortunately, all I can say is, well, enough to convince the reader, right? Um, but use things like relative importance to judge how much detail you need to put in, again, that valuable real estate of your proposal pages. If it's the most important factor, then certainly spend a great deal of effort in the details in the weeds in that area. And if it's least important, perhaps not so much. Page limits, hopefully if they said a 30 page limit or a 20 page limit, that didn't simply come out of thin air, but that was based on how much information and detail they're looking for in order to make their decision. So if it's a 30 page maximum limit and you're struggling on page 20 to generate more, then you're probably not giving them the level of detail that they needed to make that decision. Subsequently, if it was a 30 page maximum and you're on page 40 already, you may be going a little bit further into the weeds than what they envisioned. Anyway, that's a little bit about the proposal from the evaluator's perspective. I think I'm turning it back over to Kara at this point. Thank you. No, thank you, Gary. That was really wonderful. Great insight into how uh, the government uh, looks at the proposals. Um, now for our next speaker, we have Juliet Fletcher. Um, we'll be discussing writing to win. Uh, Juliet has over 30 years of writing proposals and um, both in the defense industry and in uh, government grants. Um, 
for nonprofits. Julia? Good morning, excuse me for being a rogue presenter. <laughs> Well, so <clears throat> I want to follow up with what Gary was saying. I made a couple notes. Um, one of the things that is so important is to understand that no matter what you're doing in proposals, <laughs> it's persuasive writing. And persuasive writing is about trying to get somebody to do what you want them to do, <laughs> right? Or agree with you. Um, so this is we're going to look at the screen for a second. I want to talk about two things. One is grants versus government contracting. Both of those are persuasive writing. They operate in a different way. Um, grants are different from government contracts and we don't need to go into all of that. But both of them are trying to convince the buyer or the granting agency to either purchase your services and product or to give you money to accomplish the good work of the nonprofit. So it's the same thing. It's all persuasive writing. It's, it's persuasive writing is sending your boss an email on Monday, wanting Friday off. That's persuasive writing. Um, some are, some are better at it than others. And we, those of us who have more than one child know that different children are better at their persuasive techniques than others. So it is an art. It is truly an art, but it can, be learned. It can be learned as a skill. So when you're writing to win anything in government contracting, grants, whatever it is, this is sort of built on Maslow's hierarchy of needs where the tiniest little thing at the very top would be the, the pinnacle, which is self-actualization. But in reality, I just use this to sort of give you the flow. You, you really want to think about all of these things at the same time. You must comply with the requirements. That is an absolute must. That is the foundation of your response. You've got to align your solution and your delivery with the evaluation criteria. So when Gary was talking about um, how do you do page count and how do you weight your content, you weight it on the evaluation criteria. And a lot of the knowledge that you have as you go through this government contracting process is you learn about your customer and what really matters to them. So you want to always take care of those matters with an appropriate amount of content. You always want to state your benefits, the benefits of your solution that alleviate, reduce the customer's needs, wants, and concerns. You want to clearly articulate that solution, why they should pick you. You use graphics and organization of your um, document, the presentation to further tell your story and convince them of your capability. Um, you edit and you prove and you polish and style. So currently I'm working on a proposal where we're working with some of you may have heard storyboards where we sort of do an outline. Well, I fold all of these little pieces in the editing and proofing. I'm kind of editing and proofing as I'm going, but first I've got to comply. Second, I've got to make sure that I'm hitting those evaluation criteria. Then I start looking at how can we fold in those benefits. And then I want to talk about why us. And then can we create a graphic that describes our solution or process better than trying to write it out? Often, yes, that's true. And it doesn't have to be a complex, la di da gorgeous work of art. It just needs to convey what needs to be conveyed better in an image than in writing. And then you edit and prove and make sure, like Gary said, that your punctuation is correct and that your grammar is right and that you've spell checked it, particularly that you haven't taken boilerplate from another proposal and left that other customer in the proposal. <laughs> That's a tricky one. And I think most people who work in Word, um, MS Word know that there's a fine. So I suggest that you always, if you're using boilerplate, as soon as you put it in, type in however you use that other customer's name and do a replace with your um, new customer and then you polish and stop. Okay, so the next, so I was designated the one to just talk a little bit more specifically about the um, RFP itself. Whether it is a um, municipal, county, state government grant application um, or um, formal RFP from a um, prime contractor for you as a sub or from a government agency, there's certain things that are going to be in it. One is going to be a, a statement of work, which is saying, what is the work? What are you supposed to be doing? And how long is it supposed to take you? 
and who are you supposed to do it with and what's what is the customer going to supply you and all those kinds of things what kind of um, requirements do you have to meet on conditions and notices um, with certifications and Ed's the expert on that um, and then it will include how they are evaluating they must include how they are evaluating the proposals um, and how the awards will be made and sometimes you get a when they'll be made but that's not always accurate so with federal contracts, often, most of the time, not always, you have an RFP that has these key sections of C, L, and M that Gary referred to. Um, I responded to government um, RFPs that did not have a C, L, and M, and we had to kind of go hunt for it. Um, <clears throat> C is a statement of work, what you're supposed to do. And often that statement of work um, turns into the contract that you um, will fulfill. A lot of the, um, the uh, content in there will be directed at you to tell you what you're supposed to do and then your contract will say the same. Um, the, you can go to the next um, slide, I think. Yeah, C. So C, that statement of work or sometimes called the performance work statement, whatever it's called, it's that description of the work to be performed. This is really key. <clears throat> You want to address and respond to every single statement in the RFP that says you will, you must, or you shall. <clears throat> um, in fact, sometimes it's very effective to do a find in the document on those words to make sure you don't miss anything. I actually use a red pen. Um, and underline the words so that when I go back through, I make sure that I've hit all those. Those are the commandments of the RFP. Those are what you must do. So we can go to the next slide. Section L um, is going to tell you a lot of different things. And one of the things it'll tell you is what kind of contract it is. What are the solicitation response requirements? You can read this. What are the requirements? How many volumes? Are there different volumes? What are the, what's the page count? what font size, and, and this, is, this is extremely important. Font type and font size must be exactly what the customer is asking you for. You do not present a proposal in Arial 11 <clears throat> that says you must present in Times New Roman 12. You, you're just booted out immediately. The other thing that's critical is um, when you put graphics in, Often they will say that including graphics and tables, you can't go below, let's say 11. Well, it's really hard to read below 11 point. And you have to remember the reviewers reading oodles and oodles and oodles of, of proposals. So their eyes get tired, <clears throat> which is why they often use Times New Roman because that type of, um, that font is much easier to read than Arial. <clears throat> so when you use a graphic, you need to make sure that all of the words in that graphic comply with the font requirements. Sometimes that can be more complicated than you would believe, but it, it's an absolute necessity. Um, it tells you how you submit and when the deadline is. So L is very important for creating your document and aligning your calendar and all of that. So M. <clears throat> M is, um, will tell you the evaluation factors. It's either called M or it's the evaluation factors or how we will base this award. You know, it could be said, a whole bunch of different ways. Um, and it will tell you how they're going to uh, evaluate and weight the different portions of the response. So a complex response will have a technical volume. Um, this will, a compliance will uh, filter through all of it. Um, there will be, there might be a risk section. <clears throat> they may have a comment about risk. Your past performance or relevant um, experience or past experience. Past performance is a, is a different um, term in and of itself that requires some other um, uh, compliance issues but the, or challenges sometimes, but um, when they say relevant experience or past experience, you can, you can be a little, you, you, it's a little more malleable. Key personnel is really important. I do a lot of uh, key personnel resumes and it's extremely important to to a proposal that is a butts and seats kind of proposal where you're supplying them with people. And they, that is part of how they know that they are getting a team that can do the work. 
those key personnel, every, you know, so they are contracting with people, as Gary said, it's about relationships. So those key personnel are truly key, important to catch all of their, their experience matching the requirements to make your team look the best. And then of course there's cost and sometimes cost outweighs everything. Then there's that value that Gary talked about. And then, you know, there's just a whole bunch of other things that go into it, but you really need to keep going back as you're writing to those evaluation factors. Are we hitting it? Are we, are we telling that story? Are we looking our best? Are we nailing it? And, and really and truly, those are questions that we, I ask my um, clients, is this what the customer wants? Is this what they value? Is this hitting that evaluation factor? Okay, so the next slide, please. <clears throat> so, writing to win, getting out of the document. For a very, very long time, we only had that top image, which is of the earth looking at the moon. And then we flew to the moon and back again. And we got a view of this blue dot. And it changed our perspective about our planet, ourselves, our place in the galaxy and in the universe. And what I'm using that to illustrate is that it is about perspective. Before we saw that, that little blue dot, we didn't really have a sense of what it, what we were, what it was like to be out in space, and now we do. So it's about perspective, and in writing to win, it's not about you. It is not about you at all. Any kind of persuasive writing, it is not about you. It's about your reader and who you're trying to persuade. So next slide. <clears throat> One of the ways to do this is to create a mindset of collaboration. And as a collaborator, you empathize with your customer. So if you really know your work and you really know the work that the customer is needing, and you may actually know a little bit more about it or they wouldn't be putting out a, an RFP, truly. You know, they need somebody to come in and help them do what they do. So they're looking for experts. They're looking for you to solve their problems. So you can empathize with them. And when you empathize, instead of being a contractor, you become a collaborator. Instead of sitting on the other side of the table, you're sitting right next to them and trying to help solve their problem as a partner, as a collaborator. And that mindset changes the way you write. It changes the way you present your solution. And then one of the other way, one of the ways you do it in writing is to use their language. So if they call some widget a certain name, that's how you call it doesn't matter what you, you know, particularly if you're trying to step into another um, industry, if you're going from um, healthcare staffing to um, what other kind of staffing, some kind of facility maintenance staffing. It's still a staffing contract, but they use different terms. Next. So I use this illustration with uh, Miles Davis tune, so what, uh, because it's, it's a classic tune for one thing. And the tune actually asks the question, so what? And so what is the most, one of the most important questions that you ask of yourself when you are responding to an RFP? And you wanna ask, answer it before it's asked. So what? What is the answer to that question? Well, it's your discriminators, it's your value proposition. Why you plus them equals a win for them why you are the one they need to pick. So what if you have these, all these gadgets and smart people, what difference does it make? You can list all that stuff to your blue in the face, but if you don't connect the dots of how it matters to the customer and what it's gonna provide the customer and how it's gonna ease their pain, yeah, that's all great. Those are all great widgets. So what is the question? And you need to answer, answer that continually through your response. Go to the next slide. Here we go. So um, we can do a half a day on writing a value proposition. And we're not going to do that, of course. But there's some key elements that are um, really, you can, that can help you refine it. You want it to be really clear. You want to, I actually heard this woman um, recently talk about it as a, um, an equation and I use the why you plus them equals a win for them. It's that kind of equation. Why you 
that clarity so they can understand it. It communicates the specific quantifiable quantitative results that the customer is going to get as a result of hiring you. It explains how your solution is different and better. And how do you know if it's better? Well, you need to know your competition. And we're not going to go into talking about ghosting because that's a very delicate art um, of, of doing that. But there are instances where I was just working a proposal this spring where the team I had had been on the last um, effort um, for this building of this um, deep space network antenna. And they had actually been called in to fix what the competition had screwed up. Well, we didn't really have to ghost them. We could just say that we do it right the first time and on time. Simple. Um, it needs to be able to be understood in five seconds. And some of these things are in call out boxes in your proposal and, and such. Okay, here, yeah, sorry. All right, so how do we tell the story? Well, first of all, what we're doing is we're making our customer the hero of their own story. They have a problem, we're gonna give them a solution, which is gonna to lead to their success. And we have to understand what success is for the customer. Their success is different than ours. And we do that by describing benefits, features, and proof. Many people who've gone to Shipley and all the other training do the feature benefit. My feeling is that I don't know about you, but I read from left to right. And I may never get over to the right if what I see on the left is what I need to see, particularly when I've got to read 50 proposals, 50 150 page proposals. So my theory, and it has worked so far, is to put your benefits on the left, put your features in the middle, and then put your proofs. So what does that mean? Benefits are painting the picture of what success looks like to your customer. So if they need to reduce something or they need to improve something or they need to create efficiencies or they need to complete something by a certain time frame, that's the benefit that you're going to deliver to them. The feature is how you deliver it. Two very different things. Benefit is what success looks like. Feature is how you deliver that success and the proof is how you convince them that you can deliver. So go back to key personnel. How do you convince, how do you convince people with your resume that you can deliver what the um, position requirements say? Because you show that experience, you show accomplishments, you show proof. You can do it in a call out. Your past performance should align. That's your proof, that's your substantiation. You can tell a story, a brief story about how you ramped up 500 staff people in six weeks you know, we're ready to roll during the transition period, whatever it is, whatever it is. And it needs to be accomplishments and proof that resonate with the customer. Not things that you're necessarily proud of, but things that resonate with the customer that are relevant to the, to the um, um, RFP, right? So in writing to win, you want to put their problem in that rear view mirror. You want to be compliant in every way. One way to do that is when you do, if you're doing a simple um, response and using an outline, is to um, drop the RFP requirements into each section of your outline. And then in a different color, like purple or something, a small font. And then make sure you delete them, of course. But make sure, I, I literally take a check mark and put it on top of key words. I parse every phrase, I parse every word, the evaluation criteria in the statement of work and I check them off and make sure. And as I write and as I'm um, working through the, the uh, outline, I literally just start deleting the ones that I've done. So if I have to go back to subject matter expert and go, oh, okay, I don't have this yet. Can you explain this or can we write this together or whatever it is, then I can delete it. So you want to shift your mindset from contractor to collaborator. Be a partner. Be empathetic. Understand your customer's problem and focus on that. Yeah, man, you really need this work because you've got to make, you know, you've got to make, you're trying to grow, you're trying to um, um, in, in, um, increase your revenue, whatever it happens to be. You need to put that over to the side because you're not going to get that unless you can really, really persuade the customer that you are the one. And one of the ways is by being a collaborator and a team member. So you want to focus on the customer success and that you're going to accomplish the mission. 
some of these proposals that I write, we use um, mission certainty, accomplishment and mission certainty or mission fulfillment, um, because these things are critical. This matters to them. Um, government agencies have Congress to, re to report to. They've got to prove that this money that they got, same thing with granting agencies, that this money that they got was used um, efficiently, effectively, and, and is accomplishing the task with a reliable um, contractor. Your features are your solutions that deliver the success. Your proof is the proof of your capability to do the work. So I say write without fear and edit without mercy because you've got to get it down on paper. Just get the stuff down and then go back and clean it up and tighten it up. You can't edit enough. One of the reasons I love um, proposal work is you have a deadline. You eventually have to stop. You put the most important thing first. So let's talk about that for just a second. Each section, 1.0, introduction, the first word should, if it's a contract to NASA, it should be NASA. Each section, the first sentence in each section should introduce the section by introducing the benefit to the customer of all the stuff you're going to explain afterwards. I spend a great deal of my time taking the last sentence in a paragraph that um, my customer has written and moving it to the top of the paragraph. So I want to break something here, just break it right in half. Everything you learn in English composition about how to organize your thesis and your essays does not apply here. Don't wait to give me your conclusion. The conclusion is the benefit to the customer. Put it right in their face. You start there. So if you find yourself explaining and then finally getting to your point, take the point, move it to the beginning of the paragraph, move it to the beginning of the section. And you know what? If you do a good job in those first few paragraphs and you've got some nice graphics and call outs, your reviewer may just go, okay, if you've nailed it. They may, they may have to read further just to get your detail, but if, if you've done a good job in that beginning, they don't have to suffer. They get it. They get that you've got it, you understand them, and you have a solution. So you always want to read and edit for compliance and customer focus, those two things. Have we focused on the cu customer, put them first? Are we compliant? Are we nailing the evaluation criteria? One of the methods that um, someone I used to work with um, did, and it really works well, and I do it sometimes when time allows, is to screen share and literally walk through that proposal with your subject matter experts, making sure that you're accurate, you're saying things right, you want your capture manager there, making sure you've got the right customer, um, you know, till, and also all of those eyes on the document at one time, make sure you capture all your oopses all your oopses. Um, oopses are, are a sign of not being perfect. No one's perfect, but too many oopses, too many typos, too many half-finished sentences, graphics that aren't where they need to be, um, tables that aren't in the section where they really need to be, or things slip when you go to um, save it in PDF. Those make a difference. So what's my last slide? I think we're, there we go. You're never going to get perfection. You will never get perfection. There is, there is, we don't get to be perfect, but you can be very good and you can definitely um, present your solution in a very customer forward, compliant, benefit focused manner. It doesn't change your solution. What it does is tell your story better and persuade the customer. That's it. Well, thank you, Julia. That was very informative. Um, Eric is posting the proposal template into the chat box that Juliet has provided uh, to give you an idea as to what the cover letter would look like and what a, the um, actual cover of your volumes would look like and uh, how you would organize your actual document. Um, so thank you again, Juliet. Now on to compliance. Uh, without being compliant, you're not going to win. Or if you win and you're not compliant with doing the contract, you're going to lose money. Um, so with that, I introduce Ed Kinberg, who's been practicing law in uh, government contracting and construction contracting 
and also is a retired JAG officer. So, Ed, go ahead. Good morning, and thank you for attending. And Gary and Julia, thank you for excellent presentations. I just want to expand before I start speaking on a couple of points each of them made. And one, I believe Gary talked about uh, the three C's, clear, concise, and compelling. There's probably very little more important than a clear, concise, and compelling proposal. If it isn't, the reader is going to disregard much of what you said. So you've got to keep that on focus. I used to work for an interesting uh, gentleman when I first started doing government contracts. And I would give him a document, and he would just take it in his hands and say, is this clear, concise, and compelling? And if we hesitated for even 10 seconds, he'd give it back to us and say, it's not ready for me to review yet, which was nice because I didn't go through as many reviews. I'd go back and really clean it up. But it's very hard, particularly for lawyers. Julia's probably a good one at limiting words, but you don't want to put in more words, duplicate words, repetitive words. You know, when I went to law school many years ago, they used to make us read a book called Plain English for Lawyers that was just outstanding. Um, also, um, I want to emphasize when Julia was talking about coordination, it's very important that you carefully read sections L and M, and they aren't always going to be there. She is right. Sometimes, especially in lower, less complex, comple not lower, but less complex procurements, they um, don't issue a formal traditional RFP or RFI, but they issue, I noticed several Veterans Administration contracts like this, just a, a letter almost. You have to find out what the instructions are, and you have to find out what, the, what they're looking for in awarding it, and specifically address it. Probably the single biggest compliance issue that I've run across with people not getting awards is that they don't answer the question asked by the government. If the instructions tell you to repeat your principal person's resume in all four sections of whatever you're writing, put it in all four sections of whatever you're writing. You've got to keep in mind that that proposal is going to be broken down and given to different evaluators, especially for more complex proposals. Or they may just turn to that page in the section and say, okay, did they have it as a check mark? If you don't meet all the check marks, your proposal will not be seriously considered. So it's important to coordinate the instructions and the evaluation factors, and then also, of course, a statement of work to make sure they're all consistent and ask the question if you have anything that you don't understand. If there's an obvious question buried in an RFP, if you have an obvious question, I don't want to say buried because it's a different rule. If you have an obvious question in an RFP and you don't ask it, you lose the right to ask that question forever and you lose the right to get any changes or adjustments to the contract forever. If they can prove, if they can establish to a court satisfaction or a board satisfaction that you knew or should have known of the ambiguity in an, in an RFP, then you cannot benefit from the ambiguity later. You have to ask it. So don't play games and guesses with unclear provisions. I know you're, many of you may be concerned about leveling the play field, playing field because others may see your interpretation and act accordingly, but it's the only way to protect your award. Uh, I finally want to mention a, a, a the primary website that I use, and I check it several times a week, is WIFCIN, with Whiskey India Charlie um, Khan. Charlie, Oscar, November, wifcon.com. Wifcon.com is one of the best websites I've ever worked with. It's a free website. I'm not even sure who does it. I've looked for the owner a couple of times and can't really figure it out. But it has all the daily updates to everything. It has regulations. It has executive orders. It has the FAR regulations. It has the sub-regulations. It has bid protest decisions. And one of the interesting things about bid protest decisions is it all, it can sort them by FAR provision. So if you have a FAR provision and you're not sure how you respond to or what it means, go to WIFCON, go to the protest in cases button and skip, click on the FAR provisions and it will uh, bring up a list of those cases. Now, onto my slide. We're talking about different, diff, uh, I'm sorry, Kerry, go back one, please. Is we're talking about compliance with certifications and FAR clauses. I noticed that about half of you are subcontractors 
about half of our respondents to do subcontracting and half of our respondents do prime contracting and a large percentage of our contracts do both. We had, it's interesting, we have more than 100%, but there's some to, to, to do both. But compliance, if you don't, aren't a direct federal government contractor, if you just do subcontracting to primes, you aren't required to be registered in SAM. However, in your prime contract, you are in the prime contract that required to flow down most of the certifications. And con primes, the big primes are, gonna get are getting particularly uh, aggressive about ensuring that you comply with all the various rules of flowing down the government contract clauses. I recommend everybody that's involved in government contracts, whether you need to or not, register on SAM. If you change your name or your employer identification number, you probably need to re-register or, or set it up, uh, set in a new authorized affidavit letter because they only apply the authorized affidavit, authorized representative identified in the, in the affidavit you send to them uh, for the company name and EIN that you initially applied under. So that's not an unusual problem, but it can be a lengthy process. So if you're changing your name, get that stuff straightened out beforehand as much as you can. Um, and then also, there's a bunch of clauses you're going to have to certify. And, and I did this myself when I first registered in SAM with my previous law firm, is I actually printed out the whole registration form, all the clauses, and read each clause so that if somebody asked me in the future, do you know what you certify to? I could say, yeah, I do. It's, just, it's not just a question of what the name of the clause is. You've got to read it. It's cumbersome. It takes time. But if you're a small business, especially if you're getting start just in your first couple of years, it's a lot easier to do it now than it is to do later. So I strongly recommend that you do your SAM registration, your certifications, and you review your subcontract from the prime and see what kind of flow down requirements there are and what kind of requirements there, and what kind of things that flow down to you. One of the things that's gonna flow down to everybody, is flowing down to everybody, is the cybersecurity maturity model certification. Starting maybe three years out from now, they keep pushing the deadline back, Nobody is going to be able to do business with the government or a government prime contractor unless they have the CMMC certification, which means you had an outside assessor come in, look up your study your security system and ensure that you meet the minimum requirements for level one. If you do higher level projects, you might have to get into levels two, three, four, or five, but it's absolutely critical. You cannot work as a government contractor starting in a, about three years, starting now, but overall in about three years when it's fully implemented. Right now it's still being implemented on certain contracts. And then also keep in mind, you have to have appropriate business systems. I know as a small subcontractor, it's easy not to worry about having a CAS compliance system or a government FAR accounting system, but it's much, much easier and safer to set up your accounting system to match the FAR requirements before you start doing business or as you start doing business. Uh, I recommend getting a contract, an accountant that has experience with government finance and set up your cat, your categories and codes correctly so that you can get that information if you need it because you always remain subject to audit for up to seven years after the final invoice for the project is submitted. And then of course, appropriate business systems means you have an ethics policy, that you have quality control policies and all the other stuff that you need. Uh, compliance and government contracting is everything. And uh, next slide, please, Kara. I read a great book years ago. It's available on Amazon. It's only about oh, 50 or 60 pages called Ethics 101 by John C. Maxwell. In that book, he says, he has one principle. And I, I love it because we see all these compliance policies for government corporations that are pages and pages and pages. And nowadays, web screen and web screen and web screen with link after link, uh, talking about how they maintain their business. But Maxwell's primary point is, if it does not feel right or is something you would not want a competitor or customer to do, don't do it. You know, when I was in active duty, we used to say, if you don't want to read it in the Washington Post the next morning, don't do it. Apparently, they no longer give that advice, at least in the commercial side of the government business, um, not military side, because I frequently read stuff in the paper that people should not have said or done. Same applies for Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, don't put anything online that you don't think will make sense or look good. You only want to put positive things about yourself, your competitors, and legitimate concerns 
about the government contractors. You want to develop a, 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 an environment of ethics and compliance showing that you're a good guy, you're a good company, and you're doing your best to be a good company as defined by the government. This will help you if you're a sub just doing prime work for primes. It will help you get primes to describe that a little bit in your uh, synopsis or your documents that you give to your prime contractor to say, we are compliant with government ethic requirements. Most of the time, small businesses are not required to have an ethics statement. I strongly recommend it. Next slide, please. You know, one of the odd things about compliance, and a lot of people don't understand this, is there's government has a huge variety of tools to punish you uh, for not complying with stuff. Contractual, administrative, civil, and criminal. Under contractual, your proposal can be rejected. If it says in the proposal, describe your manufacturing experience, and it says to do that in three different sections of the proposal, put it in three different sections of the proposal, even if it's identical, because they may just do a checklist in clearing which proposals they're going to review. So that's a compliance issue. Make sure you give them the information. Do they want resumes of your key, key players? Do they want job letters, job commitment letters? Look at it. You know, I had an interesting one years ago where um, I was representing the small business that was challenging someone's side pro size protest against another small business who was teamed with BAE, who's a big business, and all of the job commitments were addressed to BAE instead of to the small business. And that was one of many factors that the uh, SBA looked at and said, no, we think BAE is the real party here and we're not going to let this company be a small business. So make sure that everything shows that you're a small business, you're in control of it, that your points of contact in SAM are your small business points of contact, your mailing address in SAM is the small business address. Uh, everything is small, small, small and relates to your company and not a subcontractor or a supplier. Um, you can lose a competition if you don't do it. You find you may get hit for is for lack of clarity, or they may not understand your proposal if you aren't don't comply with some of the principles that Gary and Julia talked about earlier. Your payments can be suspended in part or in whole if you're not complying. And of course, you could have a delay in performance. Uh, any one of these things, three, last three things, two things, can cause a cure notice to be issued, which you have to answer, and that just gives you a lot of extra work to do. Pay attention to the government. Do what they say they want to do. And even if you don't like it, if you don't like it and you think it's really stupid, tell them, I don't like this. I think it's really stupid. Do you really want me to do this? And if they say, yes, we do, then do it. That's your only option. You can do have legal options for challenging it, but it's better to try to comply with them. And finally, in contractual, the one last thing I want to mention is the most important aspect of avoiding disputes is, to, is, is the use of the FAR and the statement of work. So many times I see people, especially experienced people like Juliet, myself, and Gary, uh, those two probably don't do it, but I do it, and saying, I know what FAR 52.223.4 says. You don't have to tell me. Well, you know, I never do that because I don't recall what everything is, and even though I may recall it perfectly, I, which is unlikely, particularly after more than 10 years of government contracting, even though I don't recall it I'm not going to recall it perfectly. You go back and look at it, and it resolves the dispute. Because the state, neither of you are going to remember the statement of work says, do this, or the statement of work says, do, with it, do it within these, um, in the, within these um, parameters. You got to go back and look at it. So if somebody starts to argue with you, either on your team, or the government's team, or any other team, and says, this is what the contract requires, say, we're in the, let's go look at the contract and see where it requires that. Because Complying with the contract requirement is your only job. Not guessing at contract requirements, but complying with contract requirements. Varying from them will lose you a proposal, it will lose you a contract, it will lose you money, and it will lose you time. If you have a bad history of performance, you can fall into the unfortunate administrative issue, and there are some crossover between these, of suspension and debarment. You can be proposed for suspension or debarment, for failing to comply with contract terms, submitting false claims. We're going to talk about that. False claims falls in both administrative and civil um, for a variety of things. And once you are proposed for suspension, 
you cannot bid on new government contracts. Or if you're debarred, you cannot bid on government contracts immediately anymore. Either one both has the same effect. Debarment is for a specific period of time. Suspension is while an investigation is ongoing. So suspensions can be lifted early on. Debarments only occur typically after an extensive suspension and you've had a chance to, opt to fight them. Both of them give you due process rights. It is the right to challenge what the government's complaining about, but you got to go through the process. And while you're going through the process, you can not bid new work. You can always complete work that you haven't, uh, that you have already been awarded, but you cannot bid new work. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty harsh resume, saying a pretty harsh remedy for the government, and it will be listed on SAM that you are suspended and are debarred. Uh, if a suspension does come in, I recommend, first of all, I recommend you get an attorney on day one because it's something that's going to get to be a problem if you don't handle it smoothly. But I also recommend pretty much full cooperation with the government. I had a case where my client was receiving, was buying a part from a subcontractor who was sitting, sending in parts that were not, that were um, counterfeit. When the government came to believe that they were counterfeit, they suspended both of us. We gave all of the information we could to the government all of our purchase orders, all of our contract information, all of our contact information for our subcontractor and coordinated with the government. And while we were suspended, it was a relatively short suspension and we were able to get it into a compliance agreement, which required us to have an ethics statement. The other company refused to cooperate and they were, the owner of that company was arrested in an airport, you know, full fancy arrest with his hands behind his back stuff and his, compu and his computer that he was carrying with him, his notebook seized by the, by the government. So that's a much more severe interruption than on top, in addition to a suspension. So cooperate to the government. There's certain things you want, don't want to disclose, may not want to disclose, but you've got to reconsider it. You've also got to remember, and we're not getting it today, but one of them today in the detail, but one of the requirements is if you discover something wrong in your performance, you've got to notify, to notify the government within a reasonable period of time. You can't sit back for weeks, months, years, and say, well, maybe they won't realize that uh, 20 percent of my items went out with a bad QA thing with a bad QA check or no QA check. You've got to disclose it and I have had that happen before and the client that had the problem it was their internal problem it was a problem with a QA person that wasn't doing the checks and they disclosed it there were sub they disclosed it to the prime the prime disclosed it to the to the government uh, no suspension or debarment took place the part of the proposal was fixing the problem and uh, it went away after a very scary couple of three weeks. But disclosure is better. The sooner you take care of a problem, the more likely the problem is to resolve in your favor. And Gary and Juliet, you're welcome to jump in if you have any different comments. The, last, the next part is false claims. And false claims is if you do something that's prohibited by your contract, which means violating a certification, then you can be liable both civilly for damages, and your damages are three times the value of the claim, and up to, they change the number every couple of years. The last time I looked was eleven dollars or $12,000 per false claim. What is a false claim? If you send in a pay request, you are impliedly certifying, this gets back to why I said you need to read the certifications and understand them, certifying that you require complied with all the certification provisions in your contract and the, or the ones that are flowed down from the prime contract. If you aren't complying with them, I mean, Buy American is an easy one, but there's a bunch of other ones in there. Um, if you aren't complying with them, that becomes a false claim. Every invoice is a false claim. And if it's a three-year project, that's 36 false claims. And the damage to the government could be 11 times 30. The cost you could be fined for 11 times 36 plus three times the value of the false claim that you submitted. One of the biggest problems in this area is, risk areas, is uh, status claims. If you're, if you're representing yourself as a small business of one of the many flavors small businesses we have, and you in fact don't meet the requirements for a small business, then every bid, every invoice you submit is a false claim and subjects you to punishment. So you've got to keep that in mind. If you're a false small business, you need to make sure everything that you have on paper and in reality shows that these 
the person who's the person that's status excuse me there's two different things the person if it's a status issue uh, disabled veteran minority female whatever that that status person has the qualifications has the 51% uh, ownership and control and the control is a big issue because if they don't have 51% if they don't have control it doesn't matter whether they own 100% or 5% if they don't have control it's they don't qualify as a small business and if you get a small business protest before the SBA I like them myself because the government does all the work we just have to write a general letter with just enough meat to it to uh, get the small SBA uh, concerned enough to send out a letter to you the letter that goes to the contractor asks for everything all of your registration documents your ownership documents uh, your management agreements it asks for everything and then they make their own independent review of whether you're a small business if, if they find you are not a small business you do have a right to appeal it to the SBA Board of, of, of Appeals um, and you can raise any uh, challenge any of the issues that were raised by them but they can raise any issues they want in your packet so you need to keep that in mind and if you're found to be a small business uh, not a small business that could make your claims under prior contracts that have been that have been awarded to you false claims so status is absolutely critical to get correct um, and keep correct you know some of the interesting things i see is a small business will have a teaming agreement or a partnership, a loose partnership with a large business, and they'll put down the name and address of the large business as their point of contact for technical information. No large business names anywhere in your system. Everything first contact is the small business because it has to have absolute control. In addition to civil claim, to fault to, um, to civil penalties, there are also criminal penalties. Criminal penalties are jail. You can, you can, and people have gone to jail for submitting a false claims. Well, when I was in the Army, I had a, an interesting false claim case uh, involving Jerry Lewis truck parts. When I first got it, I was pretty excited because I thought it was Jerry Lewis. So I couldn't imagine making him tech truck parts, but it was not Jerry Lewis, and I never got to meet him. But I did find out that Jerry Lewis, and it was a blatant fraud, had already been um, charged criminally and was in jail, and we were just handling the civil part of the false claims action through the administrative system. Uh, and he had, as part of his criminal settlement, had agreed to a lifetime debarment, which is very unusual. And that's our criminal side, is fines, imprisonments, and a false claim of that. If you can go on to the next slide, please, Kara. So what are the basic elements of a program? And I know this seems obvious, but their integrity, honesty, maintaining an honest business relationship and fairness and competition. You know, one of the big risk areas for many small businesses is gratuities. You can only provide limited customary gratuities, a cup of coffee, uh, maybe a sandwich if you're having a buffet style lunch or you're feeding a room of people, uh, 30, 20 people that are all of different agencies and different uh, government businesses, but you can't give gratuities. But I like to, recommend is that you do nothing. Even though you can do customary gifts that are done in the industry, a customary gift can also get you into trouble if it's not customary. If you do want to give gifts, I would suggest you check with your contracting officer and say, hey, can I send a uh, gift certificate for a $50 lunch, or I think it's $25 is the limit, $25 gift certificate for a meal or Walmart or something to the COR as a thank you for doing a great job. You can't do it don't do it. That's everything. If you look like you're doing something wrong and you aggravate the wrong people, you're going to get in trouble. Honesty, maintaining honest business relationships, fairness and competition, and integrity. You know, I had an interesting incident back when I was in the Army. I was on an airplane, and these two gentlemen were standing in front of me, waiting to get off the airplane, and one of them introduced himself as a, the CEO of a fairly large corporation, and the other as a general in one of the services. And before I knew it, I was just listening to it because I was right there. And the general said, oh, my son is working is at blank in this area. And the government guy and the non-government guy said, oh, here's my business card. Have him give me a call sometime. I've always felt I should have stopped up and said right then, don't do that. Don't take that card, general. That can set you up for a problem. But it can. If I had remembered who they were and that general son got a job with that company, 
that led to a potential bidding issue, that would have been a fair, an ethics violation. It also would lead to potential criminal and civil violations. So don't give anything out other than customary gifts and check the customary gift definition where you're through, and with your contracting officer before you do that. Next slide, please. Importance of policies and procedures. Preventive medicine, um, your best efforts to comply and federal sentencing guidelines. I know you think maybe kind of odd to see the federal sentencing guidelines in this group, but the, the federal sentencing guidelines are if you are being punished criminally for a false claim, your, your punishment is going to be reduced based on your good faith efforts to comply with the, certain, the law that was the rules that were broken. That's what preventive medicine is. So even if you're a sub that's not required to be in SAM, get in SAM anyway, so you at least have the basic certifications attested to, that will make you look better for your prime and show you're a serious government contractor. But also it will get, make you force you to provide, to apply some preventive medicine tools to your own company and your best efforts to, and show your best efforts to comply. The more you try to comply, the less penalty you're gonna get under the federal sentencing guidelines for procurement fraud, and the less, less intense your suspension or debarment's going to be, uh, suspension, debarments are always intense, mm -hmm. and the more likely you are to be able to get away with just a slap on the hand, provided that you have a system in place and you can show that you take your system seriously and whatever happened was something that's just one of those unfortunate business events that just slips by and despite your good faith efforts to avoid it, just happened. Policies and procedures are everything in protecting yourself. It's easy to go online and find quality control, marketing, whatever kind of policies and procedures you need. Or um, Juliet and Gary, I believe, do you help with policies and procedures also? Sometimes I help, I've helped write internal ones. Yeah. Yeah. And internal policies and procedures, this is what we're talking about, internal policies and procedures. That shows that you're doing your best efforts and then have annual training. Next slide, please. You know, if you don't want to write or don't have time to write your own procedures, I'd recommend you look at one of these three companies. They've all published it. There's no copyright issue here. Um, apparently, I accidentally connected to the Boeing. Thank you for going to the Boeing one. Uh, but you can go on their website and you can duplicate their policies and procedures, or you can read through them and take out the stuff you want. Because you can be pretty comfortable that whatever the big contractors put in their ethics policies and procedures are stuff that's correct. I mean, they may have something odd. You can see leadership matters, um, ethics business contract guidelines, code of conduct, which is absolutely, is absolutely essential. And they give a brief description of it. You don't have to have a fancy website like this, or you could just adopt your primes. If you do a lot of work with Boeing or Northrop or Harris or L3 Harris, excuse me, I'd recommend you consider adopting their compliance, their ethics and compliance policies that they have online to show that you're consistent with what they do. But part of adopting their policies is also enforcing them in your own company with training. They may have more stringent training requirements. So you, if you do choose to adopt somebody else's, Make sure you put in a modification for your own training requirements. But I can't say anything, emphasize enough the importance. You know, and I like the way they've got it, the sub letters, subheadings on the top, leadership matters, code of conduct. Can you go to vulnerability disclosure, please? The fourth one from the top. Um, this kind of stuff is absolutely important. Speaking up, can we take a look at speaking up? Hang on, sorry, I screwed up there. It's okay. <laughs> I'm willing to change to Teams meeting. Speaking up the next to the, there we go. Uh, I'd recommend after the class that you go back to our rep, to websites and you read through these and see, am I doing what these companies recommend? Because these companies pretty much set the standard and what ethics are. Now, one of them that I don't have on there, and unfortunately, I have trouble with the uh, link to it, is SpaceX. If you go into SpaceX compliance programs, SpaceX ethics and compliance, you'll find their program also. What's interesting about SpaceX one is SpaceX is not a traditional government contractor and their program is significantly shorter, more concise, 
but still compelling. And you've got to remember, even on ethics, anything you write for the government has to be clear, concise, and compelling. And frankly, um, if we've got any Boeing people listed, I would have probably broken this one down into paragraphs half the size that it is. Once people read more than three or four sentences, that's basically I like to say the length of your, to your first knuckle, from your tip of your tongue, thumb to your first knuckle, they lose interest in what you're reading. Break it down, make it easy to read. People are more likely to read stuff that is short and addresses the issue. And even if you have to have several paragraphs to, that seem similar, break it down. Do you, what would you say, Julie or Gary? Do you agree with that? Agree. Absolutely. There's a, there are tricks to writing policy and procedures, and there's certain words and stuff that you use. And there's a lot of good stuff out there um, on that, their internet that you can Google about best practices in writing, that kind of stuff. The, the more clear it is, the, the simpler it is, the easier it is to um, understand by everyone. Yeah. Well, thank you for being, mentioning again, looking on the internet. There's a lot of great information on the internet. There's also a lot of garbage on the internet. So once you write your policies and procedures, it's a lot less expensive to do it on your own instead of hiring my, me or somebody like Julia to do it. Well, I don't write them, I just review them. Uh, to hire us to write them is to write them and then get somebody else to review them to see if they make sense, to see if they make the clear, concise, and compelling requirements, to see if they meet the requirements of the Federal Acquisition Regulation uh, and the general practices in the business world. But it's always best to do it. But you've got to realize that not everything you see on a website is correct. Not everything you see on a website is required by the FAR, and you need to double check it because your main, main issue is one, compliance with the FAR. If you fail to comply with the FAR, it can send you to jail. Your second is, is compliance with your prime contractor's codes of conduct because they can lose you a prime contractor if they find out you aren't doing it. And I, you know, I didn't mention that before, but as subs, you need to have on file your prime contractor's code of conduct and make sure that somebody in your company can say, yeah, Harris, I read it. Yeah, Northrop, I read your code of conduct. I went through it. It may have been a while, but I understand it and I realize what your obligations are. Because some of these companies uh, go further than required to by the FAR and you want to be, to them, look as good as they do. Because ultimately, the prime contractor is responsible for all violations all the way down the chain. So if you have a a CMMC certification, but you aren't in fact implementing the, the, the practice or you let it go, your prime contractor will, will be punished for it as well as you. So we're seeing, from my perspective, I'm seeing primes get increasingly particular about ensuring subcontractor compliance with both the government regulations and specific procedures and policies that the prime they have. So I'd recommend you look at one of these if you don't have a particular prime you work with, that if you have a particular prime that you find your particular primes published statements or they don't have them published on the internet send in a email to them and, and keep a track keep track of the email keep copy of it so you can so show that you um, sent it asking if you can get a copy of their policy their code of conduct business conduct whatever they want to call it you know one of the interesting things that i do for self-protection that, that i recommend to everybody is when i write a, somebody send somebody a question or summarize a meeting or what I think a policy should say. My last line in my email is always, if your understanding is different than mine, please let me know. And the reason that's important is because if you get into a dispute over what that spec means or what that conduct could have conduct item means, or whatever it is, uh, and you asked about it and they never respond, they're accepting your interpretation, the court's going to look at a quarter board is going to look at that as accepting your limitation, your interpretation. So always do it and always respond to that saying yes or no. It's the most effective business tool you have is to send back a note that says, my understanding is you want me to do A, B, C, and D, or you have asked me to watch out for A, B, C, and D. Is your, if your understanding is different, please let me know. I can't stress enough the importance of doing that. Next slide, please. In conclusion, in government contracts, ethics and compliance are everything. Your, no matter how good your production is, no matter how high your quality is, no matter how good your record for timely delivery is, if your ethics and compliance program aren't up to snuff, you risk losing your company. 
strict compliance with terms of an RFP is a critical success factor. It's not your job to second guess whether something is stupid, repetitive, unnecessary, or whatever. If you think it is unnecessary or repetitive, write a letter, get it clarified. Normally the government's clarification is C section three, paragraph four, three A of the RFP. And that's okay because now the government's failed to clarify it so you could go by your interpretation. Um, you know, I had one that's turned into a, a claim that we're still disputing where somebody wrote a question and said, your um, estimates don't make any sense in this section. You're estimating 11 of this thing. And there was actually, you showed later in the contract, there was 1,200 of them last year. What's correct? And the answer was, see the RFP. Well, that's not good enough because if they see the RFP, they can then, based on that answer, assume that the answer is 11. And the government is now exposed to having to do a change order for the greater amount because they wrote about the, the obvious ambiguity, they got an answer, and were told to do your own guess. Train, make sure your staff is, is trained and enforced, and you review, train and enforce your policies, and you annually review them to ensure at a mass, maximum protection. Sometimes a lot of training isn't required. It may just be a couple of hours. It could be webinars. It could be mandatory webinars that people can do on their own, however you do it. But you need to make sure all of your employees understand and have uh, a full understanding and have been through your code of ethics and compliance programs. Now, on the labor side, we just talked about contracts, but there's also other agencies that can come after you. The labor, labor Department of Labor can come after you. After you. The, um, any OSHA can come after you. There's a lot of stuff you have to comply with that we haven't talked about. But we're primarily talking about what I like to consider the easy stuff, the stuff that's right in your face. And all of you, whether you're federal or not, are required to have a poster showing all the wage and labor laws and whistleblower stuff that you have. Um, you can buy a poster that's updated annually that you can stick in your, in your snack room or where your sign-in room is or a place where your employees may commonly congregate to wait to go to work. And the company that we use sends you a new poster every year, updates the language because they change within all of the different categories. And they, they promise us that they've given us the full list of required federal disclosures for government contractors, employee disclosures. If you have that subscription and you miss a disclosure or have one inaccurate because of something they did, then you've got someone else to blame it on and you've made, good, um, you've made a good faith effort to comply. You know, one of the things I like to tell clients is one of the benefits an attorney can provide you is that you can ask us a question, we can provide you an answer that remains confidential. But if you follow our interpretation, our understanding of it, and you get in trouble because we were wrong, we were just flat out wrong, you can at least show you made a good faith effort to do things correctly because you consulted an attorney. The attorney told you, no, this doesn't violate the Buy American Act. No, that's not unethical. No, that doesn't violate your terms, your terms and conditions. That doesn't, that complies with your, whatever we tell you. Uh, and we don't always tell you that it complies, but you've gotten that outside opinion, which gives you an extra layer of protection and also helps you from making obvious mistakes because you've gone back to an attorney and you're kind of scratching your head like this saying, well, I'm not sure what this provision means or what I'm supposed to do here, or it looks like I'm gonna run late or run over over budget, what do I do? You don't have to worry about that if you contact somebody. There's a lot of great consultants out there too, and you could use a great consultant. I think Gary, for example, is a former um, Patrick Air Force Base contracting officer, Gary? No, I, I wasn't a CO, but um, I was assigned to work at Cape Canaveral when I was in the Air Force. So I was actually Gary, poor. Gary, somebody like Gary is, or Julius is a good resource to give a second look at it, but um, have somebody look at it. Have a, have a buddy of yours from outside the company look at it, but always ask it and keep a record of what you've asked. Well, that basically wraps up compliance in a nutshell. We've got quite a, get some good time for questions. I haven't been following the um, questions and answers, but I, I just did notice that uh, one of our questioners mentioned, uh, sent in a, share a link to a good site of glossary for government contracting, and I'd recommend you look at it. And also, I'd recommend, and I should have said this at the beginning, is everybody needs to read part three of the FAR. 
Part three of the FAR is all the ethics and business requirements. If you're going to read everything, read that section. There's very few people alive that have read all of the FAR. I don't know, Gary and Julie, have you read all of the FAR? Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Some would say it's impossible to read it and stay awake. Um, but I haven't made that part. Not sure. But you do need to read it. And when you find a part that comes to your attention or a clause that you don't understand, or you see a flow down clause that says you must comply with this FAR clause, read the clause. Print it out, not physically perhaps, but put it into a PDF and put it in your files. And then also look at part two definitions because part two defines what all the many, many terms in the FAR mean. That's the official definition not what's in the glossary, which may or may not be great, but the, what's in part two of the FAR is the official definition. And that's how court or board is going to define that term. So that's basically compliance in a nutshell. I want to thank you all for participating. And if any of you have any questions you'd like to address individually, I can't promise I'll get back to them with, quickly, but within a day or so, please uh, feel free to write me at ejk at stuartlawcs.com. S T E W A R T law dot C S dot com. The C S stands for contract stands for contract specialist. Because both me and my partner are experts in the contracting field. Well, thank you very much, Ed, on, uh, on your part in the compliance. Uh, we definitely want to keep everybody off the website contractorsmisconduct.org um, and with the legal help and having good policies and procedures and following the ethics rules. Um, hopefully your company will not ever uh, have any false claims or um, findings or debarment or anything, paybacks to the government that show up on the contractorsmisconduct.org. So, and I wanna thank all, of, both, all three of the panelists. And now it's time for us to start our questions and Either myself or Steve South will be reading the questions and I will start, uh, but please continue to add questions in the chat box. Eric and uh, Steve were, are reviewing and we'll, have, we'll be keying them up. Uh, once the question is read, I will designate who the question goes to. Um, and please note for recording purposes, we're not going to um, be mentioning any attendees' names or companies' names um, at this time. Um, so, so let's begin. And the first question that I have is to Gary. Since you were a core, um, can you explain the difference between procurement contracting officer and the small business office and uh, the core's interaction with them? So not sure I followed that. So the contracting officer is the person with the warrant they have the training and the credentials and the government has authorized them to basically speak for the government, assign contracts and handle contracts on behalf of the government. Very critical that they possess the warrant. The small business office, every, uh, every sizable government office has a small business office uh, specializing in dealing with local small businesses. Uh, it's the government's advantage and federal policy to help encourage small businesses, help them grow, help them to get involved. And the small business office is targeted at being that liaison between the small businesses out there and contracts or contracting offices that may be um, you know, out in their organization. So, for example, when you asked how we all interrelate with each other, if I'm the core and I'm part of a proposal evaluation, one of the criteria mandated by the FAR has to deal with small businesses. Are you a small business or if you're a large business, are you subcontracting to small businesses and are you meeting government goals for small business subcontracting? And in order for me to be able to answer that for the contracting officer, I have to go to the small business office who usually maintains a database or has the ability to go out and, and check with small businesses and validate those claims that could be in the, uh, in the proposal. Thank you, Gary. Uh, 
The next question we have is for Juliet. Um, what do I do if there isn't a lot of guidance as to structuring the document? It happens a lot at the local level. Can you explain? Yeah, you know, that that's always like a really interesting thing. <laughs> so um, I'll use an example. I was writing this, uh, helping a, a company write a proposal to a county school board school board district for um, some kind of mental health services for their students. They, all they did was just sort of put a bunch of questions. <laughs> what the heck do you do with that? And how do you turn that into a really professional um, crisp thing that makes it easy for them to review? So they also had some evaluation criteria, how they were going to Pick them and, and the client knew them and knew what they needed. So I began with that. What were the key things that mattered to them? And then I made sure that, and, and I structured it that way. This is, I don't know if this really answered your question or not. But then in one section, I put all of those questions as lower level section subheaders, and we just answered them directly. So um, rarely, you're not always given a real clear 1.1, 2.5, you know, that kind of structure like I have in the um, sample. So you, you use the, the statement of work, the, the performance work statement, and if you don't have anything clear there, you use the evaluation criteria. You just break it down by the evaluation criteria and lump it in the things that matter to them. Does that, does that answer your question? You kind of have to wing it a little bit sometimes but the most important thing you want to do is make sure that it climb into that reviewer's shoes. That reviewer has to use this document, hopeless or not, to review your proposal. So you want to kind of follow the order that they're using with um, as much as possible. And Gary, you know, chime in there on that. Yeah, sure. I, I agree exactly with what you said. Also, um, you can't underestimate that that helps convey to the evaluator that you've actually read the solicitation thoroughly. Sometimes the evaluator is looking at a proposal that it's clear this is their standard proposal they pulled off the shelf from the last several solicitations. When you structure your response tailored to the same structure in the RFP, you know, section two is technical performance, then your section two should be technical performance. Not only is it easier for the evaluator to find what they're looking for, but again, it also helps convince them that, hey, you actually read and paid attention to what was written in the RFP. Great, thank you, Gary and hey, Julia. Gary, here, here, here's a question that I think it's coming out of Ed's, Ed's discussion, but when he was talking about policies and procedures from the big primes, there's a question here that says, so just to confirm, we can actually copy their policies and procedures. Well, thank you for the question. There are public documents. They're not, so, but they're, um, they're public documents. You could use them. I wouldn't copy them verbatim I would, if you're going to use them, I would just put in, we're compliant with all of L3 Harris's uh, ethics statements for information on ethics, on L3 Harris's code of conduct, click here and put a little link to it. And then train your employees, whatever the, train your employees as to what those standards are. Uh, does that answer your question? Yep. Yeah, don't plagiarize. But yeah, be careful do. about it. You can't yeah. plagiarize a little bit for educational purposes, but okay. definitely don't take any symbols or, or, or special versions of the name. Those are protected. But the okay. text itself is typically, it's a public record and not typically copyrighted for those things. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ed. Uh, well, I actually had a question on coming here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, this, the, the, um, please write your question into the chat box and we will get to it. Thank you. 
Um, so Ed, this question is uh, for you. Does compliance include things like safety, accounting, and cyber cybersecurity? Absolutely. Uh, you said safety, accounting, and what was the third one? Uh, the big topic of um, of the year, cybersecurity. Yeah, and cybersecurity and safety are probably the most two important ones. The, the new cybersecurity clauses are mandatory flow downs to every subcontractor. And before long, you're going to have to certify to your prime or show your prime that you have a CMMC certification. Right now, you just have to need to have, unless that new clause is in, in your contract, which is only in a few test ones that they're doing. But you, right now, you have to have had reviewed your systems and have a, have a plan on how you're going to come into compliance. Once you come into the new program, the CMMC program, you're going to have to be in actual compliance and in compliance and certified by a, by a, a licensed assessor, which they're in the process of creating, uh, that you comply with it. So the answer is they are all mandatory flow down. Safety is a mandatory flow down. Quality control is a mandatory flow down, is a flow down. Because remember, your prime is responsible for the quality. And if they get dinged on a quality control item, and it's because you didn't look for a certain item or you didn't comply with it, it's going to come back to you. So you really need to apply this compliance concept to everything you do. But cybersecurity would be, would be most important. Also, I've got to keep in mind that we can talk about like safety, that OSHA independently of the federal, independent of the FAR, OSHA can come in and do inspections and find an OSHA violation. If you're doing outside work, OSHA has people that drive around and just look for violations and then stop and write up citations. That doesn't happen very often, but we do see it on construction sites from time to time. So, yes, you have to comply with everything. All right, here's, uh, here's one. It's a little customer or business specific, but I think there's a, a general theme here that could be useful for everybody. They give the hypothetical question, if you are a woman owned small business and after you win the contract, the woman dies or becomes disabled and is unable to be in control, is the contract still okay? Do you have to inform the entity of the situation? So I think that would apply to woman owned or hub zone or any of them. So what happens if something, uh, uh, you know, if the, if the qualifying person dies or becomes disabled? It, well, the answer applies to all of them. It would have no impact on contracts that were awarded. It may or may not have an impact on uh, quote requests under an, under an IDIQ or master, master contract agreement if they ask you to recertify your status. Um, and it could affect, it will affect your bidding on new contracts where you're certifying that you're in control. For veterans, there's a certain period of time where you can have a substitute person working for the veteran if the veteran is unable to perform their duties. But once you no longer have the qualifying person, and it's not always a person, it's maybe it's just your small business status you grew too big. Once you no longer meet that status, you can no longer certify to it. Okay. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Okay, next question is for Gary, and Ed, you can chime in after Gary's finished. Um, do agencies really provide debrief opportunities? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And if they don't automatically offer it, you should certainly ask the contracting officer for your debrief. Um, they, they will go through and tell you, uh, they won't tell you a lot of specifics about the winning contract, but they will tell you what they found in your proposal, or excuse me, the winning proposal. They'll tell you what they found in your proposal. If you had weaknesses, if you had things you didn't address, and that would be incredibly valuable. But yeah, some offices are uh, a little slow at, at being proactive in offering that. They should, at the completion of the uh, evaluation, send you a formal letter, correspondence from the contracting officer saying, um, you know, you were not selected as the winning uh, proposal. However, if you want a debrief, contact the contracting officer by such and such a date, and you are entitled to that information. There are certain circumstances where those, you know, are not necessarily uh, required or, or made available, but by and large, you're entitled to that information. Uh, 
very good answer, Gary. I just want to add a couple things to it. One is with a small business set aside, you're going to get a notice of intended award before the actual award. The date of that notice of intended award sets off your very short time period for challenging the size of the company or the status of the company. So if you have any, you know, scratching your head thing saying, I'm not sure this company is really small, I don't believe they are, you have a very limited time period to do that. Um, it can just be a simple letter to the contracting officer challenging their status and explaining why you challenge it, but you have to do it. Um, the awards, if it's a request for proposals, competitive procurement, procurement, you have to ask for a debriefing before you can file a protest. So if you don't file a debriefing and you later find request a debriefing and you later find something was unfair in the award process, you're never going to be able to file a protest. But more importantly, and I like the point Gary made, is that they're required to tell you the strengths and weaknesses of your proposal. And I recommend that even if you win, you ask for a debriefing. Just because you won the contract doesn't mean you didn't have weaknesses. I can't tell you how many times I've seen debriefings where other competitors in the debriefing, we get a list of what they were strong or weak in. We're, we don't get a breakdown or see the actual terms of the proposal, but as a protester, you can see how they did the ratings, very, very good, poor, or whatever. Um, not everybody gets a excellent rating just because they got the contract. So you want to know what their strengths are, but it's also a good first opportunity, a good opportunity to have your first uh, discussion with the contracting team that's going to be managing your contract. Uh, it may be in writing, and if it is in writing, you need to clarify, send back a letter clarifying things you think are incomplete in the written debriefing. But debriefings are required when requested. I believe they have to be requested within, and I always hesitate to say a day, five days of the day you first learn of the award. Um, if you don't do it, you're finished for that contract. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ed. And here, here, Kara, here's a question. Somebody's asking, and it's probably for Gary, I imagine, and the others could chime in too. How do these proposal techniques and best practices translate to an SBIR, which is more research-based? Is that anybody, Gary, you have a sense on- uh, Sure, I, I haven't done SBIR. SBIR is uh, Small Business Innovation and Research, yeah. I believe, um, administered by Small Business Administration. So uh, I have not participated in those, but uh, my understanding is they're handled mostly by grants. Uh, and as they try to determine who is worthy of receiving those grants, there could very well be some, you know, follow that similar model, finding the um, criteria that they're going to use and publishing that and using some sort of uh, analysis on those evaluation criteria. It's probably a similar approach, but I don't know if Juliet has seen that in her grant work. So I'm going to try and do this as simply as I possibly can. There are three ways. I'll preface it by saying I actually had to explain this to this, the company leadership that I worked for when they were looking at going into cooperative agreements. So if I had a dry erase board, which I don't, I would be able to explain it better. So here's the world of the government getting work, getting stuff done. On one side, you have federal procurement, which is the government is looking for people to provide services to the government, to do work for the government. So they hire a maintenance team to take care of the terraza floors in the Pentagon. All right, that's taking care of government buildings. That's just a really simple example. All right, then on the other extreme are grants. Grants are written uh, or are put out there to look for people and agencies to do things on behalf of the federal government. In other words, procurement looks back towards government, grants look away from government. So grants work more like a science fair project where we hypothesize, if y'all remember this from your children or your own <laughs> high school, we hypothesize that we will achieve these results using this methodology using, and using your money. <laughs> and the results that you're achieving match what the granting agency wants. I hope this makes sense. There's a piece in between called cooperative agreements. Cooperative agreements are a blend of procurement and grants. 
They can be for nonprofit and they also can be for for profit companies. Now, to go back to SBIR, it doesn't make any difference what you're writing. If you're trying to convince somebody to give you money to do something, in my world, it's persuasive writing. So it's all about understanding what they're looking for. If you're writing a grant, you need to understand the impetus and the intent of the program. When I was writing grants for Eastern Florida State College, um, I had a copy of a um, Higher Education Act on my desk all the time. Because when we would do um, um, any kind of uh, grant that was flow down money from the federal government to state to local, we had to understand what the intent was above. Much like you talk about the FAR, that's regulatory, but when you're looking at understanding intent, you have to understand the enabling legislation on the grant side. So to answer your question, it doesn't make any difference who you're writing for or to, you are writing in a persuasive manner looking at trying to solve the problem as you understand it for the customer, for the granting agency. So that was um, grants versus federal procurement 101. <laughs> Thank you. Did that yeah. make sense to everybody? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Let me throw something in there too. There's also a category called other procurements, which have, may or may not apply various different FAR rules. But an SBIR proposal is very similar to an unsolicited proposal. And you can submit unsolicited proposals saying, this is what we'd like to do for you, this is why we think you need it, and this is what it's gonna to take to get it done. Just because it's not been solicited doesn't mean you cannot propose it. You do need to mark unsolicited proposals as proprietary information, as you should in your RFP with all of your technical stuff. But you can submit unsolicited proposals, and those can lead to a contract award. But regardless of what you do, you have to make sure, well, particularly important in unsolicited proposals, is you have to make sure that your first couple of paragraphs clearly, 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 I can't say that enough, identify the government's need and how you are specially positioned to make it. Other procurements, uh, unsolicited proposals are generally focused on things that the government doesn't normally request proposals for, but you have a unique approach to. It's not that different than an SBIR. The SBIR, the government asks, puts out a general request for, um, for proposals, and, but an unsolicited one, is kind of, they're kind of the same thing. You're telling the government that you can meet a specific need, you can meet, a need in a way, meet, a way, meet it in a way that's unique, and that the government will save money or get better product for some reason. So you can't do that, but the same proposals apply across the board. Uh, thank you, all three of the panelists. Um, just as a time notice, it's 10.57 uh, a.m. Can the speakers continue on for another 15 minutes to ask? Good. Is everybody, uh, are all three of you good to stay past our designated time? So let's continue. Steve, do you have additional questions you would like to ask? Well, there, there's about three or four questions that have a common theme around the idea of I can't get a uh, contract if I don't have experience, um, but I can't get experience if I don't have a contract. So what advice do you have for newbies? Yeah, that's a, I, I guess we'll start start. with Gary on that one, yeah. I'll, Go the other way. Go commercial. <laughs> I'll start. the, um, And that's a, a common question, right, is past performance per the FAR is a required criteria unless the contracting officer has documented some you know valid reason why it should not be so the argument is always if i have to have past performance and i'm a startup first time or how do i get that how do i get those that experience base and um, first of all um, there are certain contracts certain set asides that are out there that do allow for um, first time companies, startup companies to participate. But second, perhaps um, more valid to this audience is, is really the whole concept of partnering and being able to partner with maybe a, a prime contractor or another contractor who possesses past performance and um, having even personnel, maybe not your whole business, but personnel who have a certain skill set and a certain level of experience 
may qualify you for past performance. But yeah, that's a, a common common question. And the past performance is always always looked at except in some situations. But my advice from my perspective is always trying to find those opportunities to partner and and through the um, the government's point of entry, the SAM Gov site where they post all the solicitations by exploring different RFPs and solicitations that are out there, there's actually a menu where you can add your name, your company's name as a list of interested parties and looking for opportunities to partner that other people looking at that same contract can see your name and vice versa. Uh, Gary, while you were talking, somebody chimed in with a follow-up question uh, regarding commercial past performance. Does that, is that weighted at all? Um, or are they strictly looking for government past performance? I'm not exactly sure what you mean. If you did it as part of a, a commercial company, you mean your personal? Yeah. Well, they, they might have commercial experience doing something. Um, how does how does somebody like you in the in the a reviewer role evaluate a purely commercial past performance um, situation? Well, yeah, Gary's, well, Gary's thinking go, about it. The, to, to put in the, 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 the commercial, the government wants to buy commercial in most cases. So um, the uh, commercial experience is very wanted by the government. So Gary, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it, certainly it should be spelled out in the RFP or the, um, you know, section M exactly what they're looking for. But in, in procuring commercial services or products, it may just be something as simple as how long they've been in business or, um, you know, there's also a government database that's out there where contract offices um, archive past performance on contractors. Uh, it, it really depends on how the RFP is worded. Thank you. Uh, if I could chime in too, you've also got to keep in mind that the government is not supposed to keep a past performance database. If you've got an issue with a problem past performance, you need to check the database. You can check it for your own company. And if you have past performance problems on a similar contract, if you can in your proposal, it's good to explain away. Yeah, we had a question on the, on the grass cutting contract, but that was resolved to all of our satisfactions. Also, um, Commercial past performance is better than no past performance. If the contract is for circuit card assembly and you have no federal circuit card assembly, but you've been making circuit cards for 40 years, that has a big impact. And it may be enough to get you over the reluctance the government may have to deal with somebody that's not done contracting specific to the government. So commercial past performance can be a benefit. And usually they'll tell you what kind of past performance they want and what kind of work they want. But don't ever discount commercial past performance and keep in mind that all of your past performance is available to the government in a database and sometimes things will sneak up on you that you didn't think they knew. Thank you, Ed and Gary. Uh, Steve, do you have some other questions? I do. Um, seems um, to be, we seem to be going through a Gary phase here. Here's one probably to start with Gary. <laughs> But the, the question is, uh, what trends do you see related to OTAs and how might FAR workarounds continue to be adopted? Have you worked with OTAs, Gary? Yeah. No, that really doesn't apply to me, my experience. Yeah. Sorry. Other, Ed, transaction, or... other transactions can only be used in limited circumstances. And some of the agencies are pushing the envelope because when you do another tra other transaction, you don't have to comply with any of the FAR rules. And they basically write a new contract. So really doing another transaction RFP uh, proposal kind of falls back what Julia said about being clear, concise, and compelling. You still have to make sure you have I clearly identified their needs and how you're going to meet those needs. And you need to make sure you read through all the um, I guess many of the contractors will call them junk clauses because there may be junk clauses, compliance clauses and rules that don't exist in the FAR, but do exist in the OTA. 
And sometimes in OTAs, they adopt the FAR, and you need to know that because if they do adopt FAR clauses, you're going to need to be in compliance with them. But you should consider each OTA a unique procure procurement, just like a commercial contract, and each OTA has to be read and understood on its own. Like an island. It's like a little island. Um, I did a, I did one, I worked on one, a huge one for the future attack reconnaissance aircraft for the Army. Oh my goodness, for the tiny little helicopter that the Army was wanting to design. And it was a design. It was a design and then you had to jump through all these hoops. So they had to, fu it functioned completely different. Like if you went through one hoop, you got a chunk of money to develop this by this point and then everybody got reviewed and so it's a way for them to do and i'm not an expert but it, it's the way for them to um do something outside of the norm to get something that they need that doesn't fall under um a typical procurement right ed yeah it's not that's, a typical procurement there has to be some kind of unique need or capability right. that you have that's outside the normal course of commercial contracting OTAs can be a source of an all-day conference on itself. Oh, yeah. Right. And, and small business set-asides and certifications are not usually considered within OTAs. Correct, Ed? Correct. An OTA is technically not a contract procurement. It's an agreement. It's not a grant. It's just an agreement. Other mm -hmm. Transaction Authority, OTA. Yes, and all different branches of the uh, DOD has OTA groups set up, like AFWORKS and um, oh, I can't think of the one at PDO Stride, but there's, there's, there you have all different names. So that also gives you another area to have to go research and to find opportunities. And there are to, to actually get into those, you actually have to pay a small fee to be on the team. To have the per, the um, to have the permission to actually s s reply to an OTA, so uh, definitely a new way the government is doing business. You're going to see some push to expand it because it takes a lot of pressure off the contracting people to do it that way. Um, it shortens the procurement timeline. Yeah, there are a lot of OTAs that don't belong in that category. Uh, well, that's true. <laughs> um. Thank you, Ed. Uh, Steve, do you have the next question? Uh, care, uh, go to your list. I'm buffering. You're buffering. Okay. All righty. Um, I wasn't ready for that. Oh, sorry. Well, I'll just jump in. I know when I was speaking, Juliet had asked a question that was uh, that had come across the screen a little earlier, and it oh, had go, no go? Uh, pass fail criteria and go no go and. And yes, under under LPTA, that criteria is pass, fail, or go, no go. You must meet it and comply. There's no in between. I want to make sure that it's clear that even if it's not an LPTA award, even if it's you know the larger scale best value trade off, there could still be a mixture of criteria. There could be some criteria that is scored and evaluated and criteria that is strictly go, no go, or pass, fail, right alongside it. So just because uh, it's not LPTA or two-step doesn't mean you may not see some go, no go type of criteria. The, the other thing that PTAC offers is a go, no go on whether you're going to bid on a um, um, RFP. So please reach out to PTAC if you're interested in getting that. Um, next question, um, and this one's for Ed. When should I bring a lawyer into the proposal process? Can I wait till I win the award? Day one, man. Day it one, right, on, Ed? <laughs> it depends on what the question is. Um, you need to bring in an outsider, an attorney, whenever you have a question about what your requirements are to do, whether it's in your proposal or in performance of the contract, you may not need an attorney the entire life of the contract. One of the think times you must, I, I recommend to bring an attorney is if you're a small business and you get a notice of proposed cancellation, you get a challenge to your size status, you get a bid protest, 
I'd recommend you get an attorney, at least consult with an attorney to um, see what happens. But every, if you have a problem, you're losing money or you're losing time and you don't know what to do, then see an attorney. Oh, thank you, Ed. Well, there's um, a lot of us out there. Mm -hmm. I just think I'm one of the better ones. Yeah. <laughs> Juliet, Juliet, this question is for you and then probably Gary. How does the sow relate to pricing? And do I include everything in sow? Not sure what that part means, but. Um, so you price everything you need to do to do the work. Um, and a lot of uh, con uh, proposals also include a pricing document that tells you labor categories and stuff. Um, I, I can't speak to that directly because I try to stay out of pricing after doing an awful lot of budgeting for budgeting for grants because it's budgeting, mm -hmm. not pricing in grants. Mm -hmm. I uh, don't really have that much to do with it. But I do know this, that um, the, the customer is looking for you. I'll, I'll tell you this, your pricing needs to align with your narrative. This is mm -hmm. true in grants too. Your budget needs to align with your narrative, with your solution. If there is something that's really important and you just give it just sort of a glancing blow in your pricing, that doesn't, that tells something to the customer that you may not have full understanding of how important this is. And, you know, so pricing, budgeting, those are all another piece of your story, another piece of your, um, persuasion and one of the, I know I have sat through pricing meetings as the proposal writer and gone well we just we talk about in the narrative about having all this this stuff where is this in pricing oh uh, oops so they need to align that that would be a high level all I can say about it maybe Gary can address mm -hmm. Gary, that would you more. like to yeah, yeah I'm not exactly sure about how does it align with the statement of work Juliet's right mm -hmm. the statement of work mm -hmm. is your basis for um, you know, assigning your work packages and pricing each of those. Uh, the government RFP may include also a work breakdown structure for you to use in order to uh, assist you in, in formulating your pricing. Um, when the proposal is submitted, typically the cost volume or the cost section is asked to be submitted separately. That's evaluated separately and oftentimes the technical evaluation team is not even given access to the cost volume. Um, that's, the contract that's officer. Good, that's a really good thing to elaborate on, Gary. The, yeah, the the contract the, the, the pricing the cost. pricing group reads the pricing and the and only and doesn't get to see the technical portion. Typically correct, and the contracting officer is required to ensure that the pricing is fair and reasonable. So they'll do. Uh, they'll probably give it to pricing experts with the government who will decipher it and, and look to make sure that it's complete and it's reasonable. And then maybe at the end, the technical team will get a look at the cost volume just to make sure that, as Juliet just said, what's said in one portion of the proposal is consistent with the pricing. And my advice to the authors is that, you know, don't leave anything to chance. Be very clear about what's included in your price and what's not. Because if there's ever any ambiguity about what's included, they will assume that everything's included and you'll be stuck with that. So make That's sure- an Excellent point, Gary. I used to, in construction, I used to have a client that would actually um, submit a list of exceptions when he submitted a bid, things that weren't included in the pricing. He would comply, of course, with all the proposal requirements, but if there were things that were unclear as to whether or not they needed to be included, he would put them on his exception list. If he got awarded the contract, he could say, hey, this is what my exception list was. I said I couldn't couldn't or weren't doing the uh, rare gaskets for the thingamajig. The, the, could also knock you out of the competition because you aren't complying, but I, I always liked his practice. He was very good at that. So there, there are a couple things that pop up um, in the, this world when you've developed a relationship with a customer, whether it's a prime, or a prime sub relationship, or with a um, a uh, governmental agency, and that is the um, 
where they just want a rough order of magnitude a wrong. And those are really interesting because it's almost sort of like a sole source. I've done a lot of those um, in occupational health and exam um, management. And um, they really just want to know, can you do it sort of how you would do it and how you would price it? And then when we would do the pricing on it, we would give them sort of a standard and then options. So, um, as you go through this world of government contracting and commercial contracting and being a sub and being a prime, you're going to get a lot of different um, uh, vehicles to um, go after business. And my suggestion to you is don't be afraid to ask questions. When you're asking questions that are going to be published to every God and everybody, be careful not to give away your solution or your weakness or your ignorance or your genius. Any of those. Don't give those away in the question. But when it's a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing and they're just kind of coming to you or you're working directly with someone, don't be afraid to ask the questions. No one is expected to know everything. And don't kid yourself. These people who write RFPs, they're not necessarily very good writers. And they're... Um, and people who send out, you know, requests for quotes and RFIs and all the other things and ROMs and stuff may not necessarily be good writers. And by asking questions, you also show that you're paying attention, that you care, and that you want to get it right. It's not, it's not a sign of ignorance. It's not a sign of anything. It actually may be a sign that the person who sent this stuff out didn't do a good job of it. Yeah. So it's to it's to be a collaborator, like you had said earlier. Exactly. To discuss it, and on Ed's exactly. point of the adding um, exceptions, we called it a, a page of assumptions when I when we would submit proposals, and that was where we would then walk through with the government and negotiate the assumption either in or out and whether the pricing needed to change, whether the statement of work needed to change or the specification, because just like Julia just said, the, um, you know, there's a lot of information in the request for proposals and not all of the documents are correct or match up to each other. So that was how we, we always handle it. We would have an assumption page in the, in our proposal, and those items would have to be um, discussed with the government. Yeah, you have to do that. You got to fill in the mm -hmm. gaps um, because everything isn't always covered. It's not always full. And when you're sitting there with a whole bunch of questions, yeah. you need to um, deal with that. Karen, can I now, ask you something? I got a question privately that I think other people might be interested in hearing. So whenever you want, I'd be happy to share that. Go please. ahead. So someone asked me, I think she actually left the chat, which is a shame, asking me about how do you deal with reviews, proposal reviews, document reviews, when everybody in the company is writing the proposal. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't go up to the C-suite because the C-suite is the people. First of all, I said, you can hire somebody, you know, like me. Or you can get everybody in a room or virtually sharing a screen and you assign the compliance person to pay attention to making sure that it's compliant. They've got the RFP. They're making sure all the boxes are checked. You've got somebody who's probably a writer or a desktop publisher type person managing the document. And you read through it. You just simply read through it together. Somebody is looking for typos. Somebody's looking for formatting issues. Somebody's looking for compliance. Somebody's making sure that you're accurate on solution, checking past performance, checking these things. That is one way to do it. And even in a good sized company, that has been our gold team. Um, with that last review or white glove, whatever the heck you want to call it, where we would all just pile in the room and everybody's looking for everything. You got like three or four eyes on it. It takes time, but um, it's extremely valuable. And I would say also that if you are a company that is growing a BD team and you're hiring folks into, like you've got somebody who's doing something else in your company, but it's a good writer and might make a good proposal coordinator or a good proposal writer, I suggest that you bring them in in all of your meetings and all of those processes to learn. 
to see how it works. It's a great way to learn and watch how the mechanism of creating a proposal actually works. So there you go. That was the answer to that question to the person I think who's left the meeting. <laughs> and, and it kind of goes with one of the questions I had is what, what is a red team? So that's really what you were just talking about. With well, there's, there is. So there, most of the people that I work with, large and small, everybody kind of follows the Shipley thing. And I, and I got a Shipley certification and it's so complex. It's crazy. And maybe Boeing does and Lockheed Martin does and you're building huge aircraft. But most of the people that I work with start with a pink team. And like, I'm, I've got a pink team deadline, pens down Saturday. And we're using a storyboard, which is an outline. So your pink team is your first blush, literally of your solution and articulating the solution. It's where you're sort of, here's what we're gonna put in, here's how we're gonna to respond to these different sections. We need a table here, we need a graphic here. This is kinda, of, maybe I even draw it and take a picture of it and this is what it looks like. But, and then people who, some of the people who are involved in that proposal will review it. And then um, usually a step up, not all the way to the CEO, but a step up will have a look at things and maybe you pull in somebody external to look at it who's very knowledgeable. And then you work for another week or two or however time allows, and then you have a red team. Red team should, the red team reviewers should be acting like the customer. I want to see me in this proposal. Uh, I'm the customer. I want to see your solution. I want to see your proof. I want to see the benefits. I want to see if it's making sense. Are you connecting all the dots? Have you covered all the compliance issues? And then after red team, you know, you have a red team recovery where everybody kind of goes back and fixes everything. And then usually sometime between red team and a few days out from the deadline, you have the final pens down and the desktop publisher and the top echelon of the proposal management team are taken over. Did that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Gary, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, well, no, actually from my, my perspective, uh, you know, I don't get into that aspect, but I, I would offer that, you know, the key, I think in these, these teams, whatever color of the rainbow you want, is that they're independent sets of eyes. They haven't been the authors. And what is clear and obvious and common sense to the author may not be the same to the person who is handed the document and told to read it and score it. And so having an independent set of eyes look at it to find those things and, and ask that same question, is this easy to follow? Do I understand the point they're trying to make? Because that's the shoes that the evaluator will find themselves in. They weren't part of writing it, they weren't part of assembling it, but they have been handed this document and looking at the evaluation criteria, told to read it and score it. Yeah, and to add to that, there's the, you know, people talk about the one voicing. And really, one voicing in its simplest form is everybody using the same terms to talk about the same thing. So um, if you're talking about risk, if you're talking about um, execution, if you're talking about trans, whatever the heck it is, everybody needs to have the same terms and the same sort of way of presenting it. So you use those same terms and then you, you can also, how do we talk about our win theme and how great we are? We want to kind of say the same thing, use the same kind of keywords. I end up as a writer having a, like a little mental list of keywords that I use over and over again to keep hammering at the reviewer. This is what we do. This is our, our thing. And I just, so one of those things about that review that I was talking about, everybody in the same room, is, is that Joe over here may have talked about something this way and Beth over here talked about it, the same thing in a different way and you want to make sure it's not a win or lose. It needs to be the right way to say it, the best way to say it, with, that is the most clear, that is the most compliant and the most compelling. Well, I think that's a good summary um, to, to end on. It's now 11.23. We've gone way past um, our time. I would like to thank our panel, um, Juliet, Gary, and Ed. I hope you will come back in the future to us that we haven't worn you out for today. Um, <laughs> we, um, uh, for everybody, for those that are still left on the conference, um, 
we will be sending out the slides and you will also be getting a survey. So please complete the survey and please add any additional um, panel discussions you'd like to hear or what other webinars you might be interested. Should, should we delve more into proposals? Um, I think it's one of our, the, the most important topics um, that we present each year and I thank the panel uh, for participating. Uh, Steve, do you have anything further to add? Uh, no, I mean, there are some questions I know we didn't get to, but if you've got the slide deck, you've got everybody's email. You've got the panelists email, you've got the PTAC email. So don't be shy, send us the question. If you send it to PTAC, we'll either answer it or we'll connect it to the, to the right panelist to get the answer for you. So certainly if we didn't get to your answer, we still wanna answer it. The, the second thing I know, and we, we, we went to a little bit of a uh, discussion on pricing. That's a great plug for our final uh, class in this series on proposal writing is going to be dedicated to pricing. So before you log off, uh, Eric put the link in uh, for that presentation in October. And I think we already have nine or 10 people have registered for it. So it's a great opportunity to get that registered and get that on your calendar. But other than that, thank, this was a this was a, a great panel. We enjoyed it. Thank you for, for thank you for arranging for this. Thank you, Steve. I enjoyed. Thank it. you all for attending, and um, we will be sending the slides out. Um, and so, do reach out to both PTAC and to our panel.